concerns? Okay. Uh, we are going to be decorating the church after the service, so if you uh, can stay for a few minutes to help put some things out, that would be appreciated. Anybody else? Keith? We're collecting stuffing for the Buster's holiday meals that we're putting out. And I see you already have about 160 boxes in place, 200, so thank you everybody. And we'll need a few more. All right, let us begin our worship. Know that the Holy One is God. We are God's people. Worship the Holy One with gladness. Come into God's presence with signing. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Make a joyful noise. For God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever and God's faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship with thanks and joy. Let us praise God in song and word and prayer.
Gracious God, we long to know you better. Open us to recognize your presence, to receive you fully, and to be ready to follow your lead. Amen. Loving God, too often we overlook the needs of people around us while we proclaim our devotion to you. We could do so much more to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, to welcome the stranger, and heal the sick. We fail to see how our prison system diminishes the humanity of all of us, how our medical system denies healing to the poor, how poverty leaves children without coats, how legal obstacles keep the strangers at a distance. Open our eyes to see your presence in every person and to respond to their needs so that we might be rightly called by your name. Amen. Though we wander, God searches us out. Speaking through Ezekiel, God says, As shepherds seek out their flocks, when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick gloom. God reaches out to us, longing to bring us even closer. Hear this good news. You are forgiven and free. Let us praise God.
And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is hope, what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in his heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every one, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and made him head over all things of the church, which his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. And the gospel lesson is from Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of all glory. And the nations will gather before him, and he will separate people one from another, as the shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you by the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, it, what, when is it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when it was when we saw you a stranger, or welc and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did for one of those least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me in eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of you, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but by the righteous into eternal life. And the sermon today is from a website called A Sermon for Every Sunday.
seeing that look of desperation, and then the look of disappointment, and the look of disgust. And I now deeply regret that I did not say yes. The parable of the sheep and the goats is the last parable in the Gospel of Matthew. Not only is it the last parable in the Gospel of Matthew, it's really the last public teaching of Jesus. It, it ends the last block of teaching. Right after this, we go into the Passion narrative and we learn about the last two nights of Jesus' life before he's crucified. So this parable is really summing up the whole teaching ministry of Jesus. Matthew is putting into this parable the climax of Jesus' teachings. For Matthew, this is the most important parable of all. It's also, I think, the most shocking parable of all. This parable has three big surprises in it. Each one has the potential for turning our life and our faith upside down and inside out. Here's the first surprise. According to this parable, on the day of judgment, when we all stand before the Lord Jesus on his throne, when everybody is gathered together and our eternal destiny is going to be determined, we are going to be saved or not saved, depending on whether we helped those in the most desperate need. This parable doesn't say anything about confessing our sins. It doesn't say anything about Repenting. It doesn't say anything about asking for forgiveness. It doesn't say believe in Jesus. It doesn't say make a profession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. It says we are saved based on whether we <coughs> fed the hungry, clothed the naked, tended the sick, welcomed the stranger, visited the prison. Now that's not what many of us have been taught in church. Many of us have been taught we are saved by believing in Jesus. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What could be more clear? We are saved by believing in Jesus. And yet this parable says nothing about believing in Jesus. It says we're saved by taking care of those in the most desperate need. And this isn't the only parable that says that. This isn't the only place where Jesus says that we're saved by our acts of compassion. For instance, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, a lawyer comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says to him, well, what does the law say? How do you interpret it? And the lawyer says, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's it. You're right. Do this and you will live. We're saved by love. The lawyer, not quite satisfied yet, says, well, but what is love? Can you define this for me? And Jesus then tells a parable about a Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan is a member of another religion. From the Jewish perspective, a Samaritan is someone who believes the wrong things. And yet, it is the Samaritan who takes care of them who courageously and generously meets the needs of a wounded stranger. And Jesus says, it is this man who has acted out love. We're saved 
by law. And that same point seems to be made again in this parable of the sheep and the goats. We're saved by acts of love toward those in the most desperate need. So that's surprise number one. Surprise number two is this. Those people that we find it so difficult to love, so inconvenient to love, you know, the poor, the desperate, the sick, the prisoners, the strangers, those people are Jesus. When we take care of them, we are taking care of Jesus. When we love them, we are loving Jesus. When we serve them, we are serving Jesus. This parable is bringing together faith and love. Gospel of John says, we're saved by believing in Jesus. But what does believing in Jesus mean? This parable is telling us what believing in Jesus means. It means that we are loyal to Jesus. And to be loyal to Jesus means to do what Jesus would do. And to do what Jesus would do would mean that we take care of the needs of those who are in the most desperate circumstances. When you look at the Gospel of Matthew, when you look at Jesus' teachings there, you'll find that Jesus is a little bit leery sometimes of our professions of faith. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter God's reign. It's not enough to use my name. You'll show whether you're on the right side or not by your fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. Faith and love. There's no gap between them. They're one. When we take care of others that are in desperate need, that is our loyalty. To Jesus. So that's big surprise number two. Then comes big surprise number three. And it literally is a surprise. The sheep and the goats, when they're told that they did or did not serve Jesus, help Jesus, feed Jesus, give him water, tend to his wounds, visit him in prison, welcome him as a stranger, they're all surprised. They all say, when did we do this, or when did we not do this? The point is, those who are taking care of those in the most desperate need, they're doing this not in order to be saved. They're doing this because that's who they are. They're loving because they want to love. The point here is, is that God judges us precisely at those moments when we're not thinking about rewards or punishments. God is judging us based on who we really are and what's really motivating us. And only God knows that. So only God can judge. We can't judge. We don't decide who's in and who's out because we don't know. It's all going to be a surprise anyway. The only one who has the capacity to judge us rightly is Jesus Christ on his throne as the king. We can't do that. One time I got an elevator. In the elevator there was a man standing there and a nun. I get into the elevator, the door closes behind me. The man who's standing next to the uh, buttons of the elevator, he asks me, are you going up or are you going down? And I said, I'm going up. And the nun right away says, only God decides that. She's right. Only God decides that. Only God decides if we're going up or going down. And it's going to be a surprise. 
Because only God knows us. Even we don't know us. And that means that we need to let go of all of our boasting and all of our arrogance. We need to let go of all of our spiritual pretensions and thinking we're better than others or thinking we're more spiritual than others. We've got to let go of that and simply live in humility and love. There's a couple in my congregation. One night, there was a knock at the door. When they opened the door, he was their next door neighbor, an older man. I'll call him Josh. And Josh said to them, my brother, who lives with me, he took out a gun, he pointed it at me, and he said he was going to shoot me. I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Can I sleep on your couch tonight? And this couple took him in, and Josh slept on their couch that night. In fact, Josh slept on that couch the next night, and another night. In fact, Josh slept at that house for weeks, for months. This couple got to know him. They got to know that dysfunctional family next door. They tried to work with him and that family, trying to sort things out. In the meantime, Josh is helping them. Josh is helping to do some fixing around the house, giving them some valuable assistance. They become close friends. And when Josh has to have surgery, and he's in the hospital after that surgery, and the hospital is going to send him home, this couple knows that if he goes home next door, he's not going to get the help that he needs. He'll die. And so they invite him into their home where they can nurse him back to health. And they did this after the first surgery. And they did this when Josh needed a second surgery, and a third surgery, and a fourth surgery. And they brought Josh to church with them. And Josh has become a loved and important part of our church family. You see, when we help those who are in desperate need, we're not saving them. They're saving us. They're saving us from our indifference. They're saving us from our self-sufficiency. They're saving us from our isolation. They're saving us from our comfort. They're saving us from our greed. They're saving us from our fear. We may put a check in the offering every week. We may give generous donations online to our favorite charities. We may vote for a candidate who promises to improve our welfare system. We may support our church in expanding its ministries to those in need. But it may be that what most reveals who we really are is when there's a knock at the door at night. And it's our desperate poor neighbor needing help and needing a place to stay. Or it's a stranger who comes up to our car window with desperation in our face, needing a little bit of money. And we either say yes, or we say no.
in our world, the peace of your will, the peace of our need. We especially pray for Judy, Mark, Bob and Nancy, Dottie, Joan, Dale, Joe, Morgan, Corinne, Barbara and Tom, Jeannie, Lois, Paul, Marlene, Chris, Patty and Mike, Shirley, Joan, Sandra, Veronica, Wayne, Matthew, Leah, Joan, Bill, Pat, Tina, Art, Jim, Carol, Kay, Chip, Sydney, Louise, Jason, Carol, Dan, Gary, Rudy, Brody, our church and congregation, and for everyone dealing with the coronavirus. And now we pray the Lord, the, the prayer that the Lord gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, the glory.
wisdom and revelation. May the eyes of the heart be enlightened. May you know the hope to which God has called you. And may the blessing of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer go with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.